13, verses 8 to 10. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. Verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides these, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put, us, put on the armor of light. Let us walk totally as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in the sexual liberality, and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desire. Thanks, um, Ron. He's, he's gone now. <laughs> uh, for reading our scripture even up to next week. Um, so today's passage is only up to verse 10, but we will actually go into our next passage, obviously. Um, so it's good to have that verse in our minds. Now we, uh, just before we start, we sang a hymn um, from our hymnals 291, Arise My Soul, Arise. Now this is probably a new hymn for us uh, to sing. And the second stanza caught my attention because um, it went like this, five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. And when I looked at that, I was wondering, you know, why, why five bleeding wounds? And obviously because Jesus' wounds were on his two hands, and two feet, that's four, and also he had another wound on his side uh, as the soldier pierced through his side and blood and water poured out. So five wounds five bleeding wounds that Jesus bearing, is bearing on the cross, received on Calvary. Um, and he says, they pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. And then he says, forgive him, forgive him. They cry. And I'm thinking, you know, who's they and who's me and who's him? And I just realized that they Poor effectual prayers, and they strongly plead for me. And they refer to the wounds, the wounds of Jesus Christ. His nail marks on his side, you know, on his um, hands, and his um, nails on, on the feet, and on the side, the spear mark uh, or the wound. They actually tore out effectual prayers and strongly pleading for me and saying, now this is the wounds saying, this is personification, forgive him, we forgive. And of course, forgive him, him refers to the hymn writer, Charles Wesley in this case, but obviously anyone who's singing this hymn, these wounds are praying for me, praying for you, for your forgiveness. And these wounds are there as witnesses of our forgiveness, or proof of our forgiveness. And that may be why, even after the resurrection, remember that when Thomas encountered Jesus uh, after the resurrection, that Jesus showed his nail marks and the spear mark to Thomas, and Thomas actually touched these wounds and became believing. And of course, his bones weren't broken, we saw that last week, and his body was preserved um, for resurrection. But of course, God has power to bring even these wounds to healing. I mean, he healed all the sick people. If God wanted, then God wanted to heal the wounds on his hands and feet and on the side. But they were left on the body of a risen Lord. It's quite remarkable to think. And perhaps when we go to heaven, when the Lord comes and takes away, and when we see His risen body with our glorious transformed bodies, we might just see those wounds on His hands, on His feet, on His side, so that we would be healed. 
just as Isaiah said in chapter 53, by his wounds we are healed. And these wounds still remain with him and they pray for us. These wounds pour out effectual prayers and they strongly plead when they say, forgive him, forgive. They cry and say, forgive him, forgive. They cry. And all let that man ransomed sinner die. So you can say that the wounds are another witness for salvation. That we sinners who are ransomed by the blood of Christ would not die because of his wounds. So I thought I'd just point that out to you so that when you sing these hymns, you don't just sing and try to you know, keep up with the melody and the rhythms, but think about the meaning of the words. Actually think about why and how these apply to me and um, the hymn writer's hearts as he or she was writing these hymns. And then that would be tremendously blessing to you as it was for me just this morning. Now let's continue with our Romans chapter 13 this morning. As we know, Romans chapter 12 and following contains so many practical teachings for our church living or Christian living. After chapter 11, we have doctrines, doctrines of sin, man, justification, glorification even, and our sanctification. They are all there. We've been through that. From chapter 12, it contains very practical guidelines and instructions for exemplary Christian living. We saw in chapter 12 that we are all members of the body of Christ, and we all serve the body and serve each other. And there are very practical lessons like uh, be diligent and do not lag in diligence and be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope um, and bless those who persecute you. Rejoice um, with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep and so on. You know, there are so many teachings and we've been through that. And this is all very practical and useful for harmonious and loving church living. And we'll do well to understand these and follow these instructions. This morning you came to church, and why did you come to church? You come to church to learn the words of God. You come to church to share fellowship with one another. You can say that you come to church because you love one another. There is no one who is here against will. You come because you want to. You come because you want to see each other and to worship God together. You come because church is a place where we can practice God's love. And these are not just the theories and some um, ethereal things that we see on the pages of the Bible. That these are real things that we can practice in our lives and reap all the benefits. I mean, we're not living Christian life just for the sake of it. We're not doing this um, superficially. We're doing it in a genuine way. We're doing it because this is real. And here in verse 8 to 10, our text today, Paul addresses about the most important thing of all, that is love. We read in verse 9 to 10 in chapter 12, if you go back to the previous chapter, Paul talked about love, and he said, Let love be without hypocrisy, and abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another, which is another way of saying that you, you got to love one another. He says, with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. So you can see that Paul's already dealt with the theme of love. But of course, once is enough, not enough, and, and he goes on to talk about love more. And we read in even a response to reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, about love, an extensive treatise about what love is and what love does, and that God is love, and therefore these describe who God is. You can say that also the church is characterized by love. Church is characterized by love. Because the head of the church, Jesus Christ, is love. Because God is love. And that's why there is no such thing as an unloving church. If a church is unloving, or if a church fails to love and practice love, then the church is dead. The church does not function as intended by God. Love, therefore, must saturate inside and outside the church. Love must exude out of the church to the people who are outside the church even. 
All the while, love is practiced within the church as people love one another. And that's, the, that's what actually draws people to the church. That's what draws people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of God's love. So understand that love is important and love is essential and love is in the church. Love is practiced in the church and church is a place where you can experience and practice love. And that is also to say that you cannot practice or experience love apart from the church. If you are outside the church, you're a part of the church, you miss out on that. That's why all the more you're involved in the church, if you are really doing ministry and living together and spending time with the church members together, then you have more opportunities to experience and to practice love. And that's why, as we shall see, love is basically uh, a doing things together. Uh, that's how it is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is all about action, doing things, not just some uh, emotions and feelings. But anyway, let's get back to our text and look at what Paul says about love in this instance in verse 8. He says, first of all, owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, Paul talks about owing something, but this is not really a passage on teaching uh, about debts or loans. This is not about borrowing things. Um, this is not a lesson on finance. In fact, the focus is on love. And he says, in verse 10 even, love is the fulfillment of the law. The focus is on love, not you know, owing no one anything or he shouldn't have any debt. I mean, of course, you can talk about um, then you know, can Christians have loans? You know, should Christians go and borrow money and so on? Um, of course, you, know, you can do that within reason if it's for business and for purchasing some large um, um, ticket item like house or car. You, know, you might borrow some money, but this is not a teaching on that wise sort of financial um, practice. This is about love. This is about love. And he says, love is a fulfillment of the law. In one same verse, in, in verse 10, you have the word love and law together, which is a kind of very unlikely combination. As a Christian, you think that we are freed from the law. I mean, isn't, isn't that the question? I mean, isn't that what we saw before in Romans chapter 7, chapter 8? We are freed from the bondage of the law and curse of the law. We are all freed from these restrictions to do with the law, and we are indeed free by God's grace. Isn't that the case? So shouldn't we, and, and couldn't we just go and live freely as Christians, enjoying God's love? If you look at chapter 7, just go back to Romans chapter 7. We saw um, these verses in Romans chapter 7 about the law. Now Paul says very clearly in chapter 7, verse 7, for example, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law sin? Or is law bad? Or is, is law curse? And he says, certainly not. The law itself is not sin. On the contrary, he says, I would not have known sin except through the law. The law taught me about my sin. And verse 12, he says, therefore the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. God's law is good, it is just, and it is holy. In fact, the law characterizes who God is. Just as God is holy and just and good, the law is holy and just and good. It is not so much the law that is the problem, but it was the incorrect use of the law. That was the problem. When they used the law to condemn others, when they were themselves under the judgment of the law, when they used the law to judge other people, when they used the law for legalisms and some rules and restrictions and say, you know, come up with some sort of new, new things and say that you can only be saved by keeping the laws, and that's the legalism teaching. The law itself is good and just and holy. It's when people distort it and twist it and abuse that law and use it incorrectly that things went wrong. And that's why in chapter 7, going back to chapter 7, in verse 13, it says, Has then what is good become death to me? The law is good, but has the law become death to me? He says, certainly not. For sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, 
so that sin through the commandments might become exceedingly sinful. The law makes sin sin. The law makes sin sinful. And it becomes clear, it appears as sin. Without the law, you would not be able to know what sin is. So the law is good. The law itself is holy and just. Understand that. So when you say in Romans, going back to our text in chapter 8, verse 10, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law, the law and love can be the best friends with each other. The law and love can come together. In fact, love is the fulfillment of the law, and in that, he's really saying that the love is higher than the law, and the love is fulfilled. Um, love actually fulfills the purpose of the law. The law actually brings love together. And we're not keeping the law to be saved, but we are trying to keep the law because we are saved. And we try to keep the law because the law is good. And finally, we are keeping the laws because keeping the law actually can promote love, and love fulfills the law, the requirements of the law. So the key is love. The key is love. The point is to love. In a sense, what Paul said in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, um, is true as well. Because it, in that verse, he says, the law brings us to Christ as a tutor. The law is, or was our tutor, to bring us to Christ. The law brings us to Christ, who is basically the incarnation of love. The law brings us to love. The law brings us to Christ. The law brings us to salvation. And through the law, we understand love. And therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. What the law wants, the law itself cannot achieve. But love actually achieves that for the law. So if you look at verse 8 and 9, again, so don't owe anything to anyone except to love one another. Just love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. If you love one another, then you've already fulfilled the law. You fulfill the requirement and purpose of the law. And verse 9, he actually gives us um, some list of laws in the Old Testament. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. Now these are the five commandments from the Ten Commandments that have to do with men. Perhaps um, Paul was a little intentional in coming up with these five, or maybe it's just a sort of a list of five that came to his mind at the time. But if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments have to do specifically with God. You shall worship the God, the Lord God only, and no uh, idolatry whatsoever. Uh, don't uh, misuse the name of the Lord and keep Sabbath. Now these four laws have direct relationship with God. Number five, the fifth, relation, fifth law has um, to do with the relationship between parents and children because it says um, children honor your parents, honor your father and your mother, and this is the first promise with this is the first commandment with promise. And then from number number six, we have six, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all here as Jesus listed, um, as Paul listed here um, in, in verse nine. But think about this. Usually, if you have ten commandments, people tend to divide them into five and five. One, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Some of them might divide them into four and six. The ones that you keep towards God, the ones that you keep towards other people. But um, quite, um, it's quite possible that number five, the commandment number five to do with your parents, is together with God, because to honor your God, honor your parents is, is almost honoring God. And those who do not honor parents would not know how to honor God, and vice versa. And that may be why Paul intentionally leaves out number five and starts with number six here and goes all the way to ten when it comes to the relationship with each other. Because the commandment that you need to keep towards your parents kind of stands out as something that's quite special. But let us set that aside. That, that's another thought. But here Paul says, look, if you love one another, then you would not commit adultery. You would not murder. Surely you would not steal from your neighbor, and you would not lie to one another, and you would not covet anyone else's possession if you love your neighbor. 
if you love each other, then you'll be keeping all these, all these laws. And that's why Paul says here, if there is any other commandment, even if there are other commandments, and there are many of them, uh, if you go to Deuteronomy, Leviticus, you'll see hundreds of commandments, and they say that um, there are up to probably 613 commandments altogether, in addition to the Ten Commandments. And out of them, there are about 665 that say do, and, and uh, the rest 200 and something um, that say don't. But even if there are other commandments, he says, they are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So if you have um, not the best memory, or you know, let's say that in this way, if you your if you have um, you know bad memory, or, or if you have some challenges with memorizing things, this is good news, because it, it doesn't say know all the laws, 613 of them all together, or know all ten commandments, because not even five commandments here, all the commandments can be summed up in just one commandment which is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Or you can even reduce that into one word and that is love. That is love. And that's easy enough. I'm sure you can all memorize that. Love one another. Put a bookmark in Romans 8. We'll have a look at other verses that talk about this. In fact, this is strewn throughout the New Testament and you'll find that it is also in the Old Testament as well. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22 first. Matthew chapter 22. Now these are the words of Jesus himself. In chapter 22 verse 37, Jesus said to him, the lawyer who came, the Pharisee who came to Jesus with the question that he wants to test Jesus. The Pharisee says, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now there are 10 commandments. And there are 613 laws all together in the Old Testament. And there are 10,000 kinds of laws. But which is the great commandment in the law? In verse 37, Matthew 22, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Quite rightly. Love God and love one another. Or love is just one word to which we can reduce these two. And he said, on these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Now these are um, you can say that uh, once it is reduced and crystallized, this is basically the, the spirit of the law. Love. Love God and love one another. And that's perhaps why John said in 1 John that God is love. He is love. This is not just a New Testament idea. As um, I, I told you, you can find this in all the other Gospels. And you can find the messages about love in Romans, in 1 Corinthians, James, and 1 Peter. You'll see love basically everywhere in the Bible. But this comes from the Old Testament, uh, first of all. So let's have a look at Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6 first. Go to Deuteronomy Chapter 6, verse 5. I, I want you to see this with your own eyes in your Bible. Because some people think that the Old Testament is not the book about love. It's about judgment and God's anger and God's righteousness. But it says here, first of all, chapter 6, verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is exactly what Jesus said. Basically, he was quoting from this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. Turn now to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19, which is um, earlier than the Deuteronomy, third book in the Bible. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Leviticus chapter 19, verse, 7, verse 18. 
You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You see that? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, we expect that the Old Testament would say something like, love God, love the Lord your God with all your mind and heart and strength. But you might think that, especially when it comes to Leviticus, which contains all the laws to do with each other, now, this is basically what we might call torts, the law, the branch of the law in our days that concern um, how we engage and behave with one another. If you do something that's harmful, if you inflict some damage to your uh, neighbor or someone else, then you have to either make up uh, through restitution or you may be punished for that as well. But here, the Leviticus is full of these laws, like if you cause your, your cow to, to die by accident, if it was in unintentional do this, if it was intentional do this. So there are very detailed laws. If someone comes up, if someone visits your home, goes up to the roof and falls down and dies, uh, did you have a fence? You, you have to have a fence. If you don't have a fence, then you have to uh, make up for the loss of the life and um, it's such a much more, um, you know, much, much more, you have more responsibility than um, if you have fence and so on. So it, it's got all these laws to do with each other. And all, in all of that, in verse 18 in chapter 19, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because the reason why you make up for the loss and even make restitution is because you love your neighbor. You treat your neighbor as yourself and you act as if your neighbor's loss was your loss and you make up for that loss. So all, the spirit of all these laws is basically you love your neighbor as yourself. And God said, you shall love the neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So you can see that loving God and loving neighbors, or ne loving each other, one another, you know, it's not a New Testament concept. It's not a new teaching that is only found in the New Testament. It is in the Old Testament as well. It is throughout the scripture. God is love, and that doesn't change, does it? God is love even in the Old Testament times as he is in the New Testament times and throughout the history. So the Bible teaches about love. And if you love, then you wouldn't do anything that is harmful to your neighbor. You wouldn't kill or steal or covet from your neighbor. And as it says here, then you, know, you love your neighbor as you would love yourself. So therefore, the ultimate purpose of the law is love. You might also recall from Romans chapter 3, we saw this before, that the purpose of the law is the knowledge of sin. The law, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And when you understand your sin, of course the natural response is repentance, and through repentance you're saved and you're brought to Christ. So you can see that, that that's how also the law, the love sort of leads, the law loves to, to Christ who is love. Um, salvation is understanding God's love, and through the law we come to repentance and we are saved and we come to understand what true love is, and we come to Christ. And the teaching from the Bible is that if you understand love, the love of God, then we are to love one another. We are to love one another. Let's turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. The Gospel of John, we jump to the New Testament now, and look at John chapter 13, verse 34. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. This is the new commandment that Jesus gave to the disciples. I tell you this new commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. Now, in this little verse, is so much. As I have loved you. In other words, if you are saved, by understanding God's love, then you love one another using the same love. Just as I have loved you, you love one another. And verse 35, if you do that, by this all will know that you are my disciples, disciples of Christ, that you are Christians, basically, if you have love for one another. If you love one another, then you show and demonstrate that you are a Christian. And that's why in James chapter 2, verse 8, James says that this is the royal law. Now, you might say that there are many laws, but the royal law or the, the summary of the law is love. 
Love your neighbor is the royal law, and love is the summary of the law. All the commandments can be summed up in one command, and that is to love your neighbors. When you look at our life in this world, as Christians, we understand that we cannot be perfect. And you might say that there is no such thing as perfect life or perfect living in this world. But you know what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48? He said, be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. And then, of course, you would ask, we can't be perfect. What is Jesus teaching? I mean, is he simply saying, uh, for the sake of saying that? Or can we actually be perfect as God is perfect? What do you think? We know that we can't be perfect like, you know, glorify Jesus Christ you know, without any sin whatsoever. That will happen through glorification. But does that mean that we cannot enjoy perfect living? We cannot enjoy being perfect just as God is perfect? I mean, why did Jesus command us to be perfect as God is perfect if that's not possible? And we come with, with all these questions. Well, let, let's think about from this perspective, from the perspective of love. You might say that there is no perfect life, but the Bible seems to say that we can and we should be perfect. Now, realistically, think about this. Now, realistically, the only way to live perfectly, as perfect as possible, is when we love one another. Why? Because God is love. God is perfect. And if you love one another, you practice that which is perfect. You're living out that principle so that you can enjoy that perfect living. In a sense, you know, we will not be glorified now. That's coming. That's to come in the future. But realistically, if you want to be perfect as God is perfect, the only way to do that is to love one another and to practice love. And when you love, then you are living in a sense of perfect life perfect life. And that's why in verse 10, Paul can say, love is the fulfillment of the law. Law is holy and just and good. It is perfect. Law is perfect. And if you are fulfilling the purpose of the law, are you not saying that you are living a perfect life? And how, that, how is that possible, you might say? Of course, it is only possible when you practice love. When you love, you fulfill we fulfill the requirement or the purpose of the law. And that's why Paul said, just back into our text, um, if you go to bookmark, you can go back and have a look at this. Verse, verse 8, in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, he says, at the end, he says, He who loves another has fulfilled the law. You have already done that. You have fulfilled the law if you love one another. <coughs> so when you love, you are keeping the law perfectly. When you love, you fulfill that perfect standard and the requirement of the law. And that is quite a profound thought. And that's why before you can argue about whether you're keeping certain rules and laws and doing this and doing that, you need to think about love. And that's why when it comes to church leaving, whatever you are doing, you need to be asking your, yourself a question. Am I doing this because I love God? And that is why people come to church and they can do all kinds of things, but they may be doing all their services in vain. You might be doing so much, but you might not be doing anything for God if you do it without love. If you do it with wrong attitude, you can be involved in all kinds of ministries and serve in all kinds of ministries and you can be very busy for God, but if you have the wrong attitude, all those things are for your own glory and for your own um, proud pride and, and it has absolutely nothing with, to do with God. When you have the loving attitude, you love God and you love one another and do that, whatever you're doing, that is to keep the law or that is to fulfill the purpose of the law perfect standards of the law. And that's crucial. That's why we always go down deep in our heart and look at our motive. Why are you doing what you're doing? 
And why do you come to church? And why do you serve in the church? Church is not supposed to be a place where people are pushed and coerced and forced to do things and get involved in the ministry. If you start to go around the people in the church and say, oh, can you please do this? And can you please do that? And people kind of try to get away from that, then I think you're on the decline. That's not how it's supposed to be in the church. Church is not a place where you come and you try to involve people against their will. You come because you want to come. Church is a place where you just come and you kind of um, just remind them. Just tell them the truth from the Bible, and then they want to do the, the work that they want to do for God. They want to get involved in ministry, and they want to come and learn and do things and serve each other. I think of it this way. This may or may not be the good illustration, but a long time ago, we used to have these spring round toys. You know those toys? You wind something, and then the toy might jump or move or do something, and after a while, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, it, it, can, it, it loses energy. All the spring becomes unwound and it sort of moves and moves and moves and moves and comes to a stop, right? And what do you have to do? To make it move, you wind it again and again and again and again. Is that what pastor does? Is that what you do? Do you have to wind yourself every now and then so that you can move and do things in the church? I, I think that's not the right approach. That, that, that's not the best picture. The better picture would be something like if there is any such thing, you have a toy that is battery powered and the battery is forever. It lasts forever. It doesn't even need recharging. It just has energy. And all you have to do is to flick the switch on and then it keeps on moving and moving and moving. It's like one of those, um, you know, those um, ever-ready battery rabbit toys that you saw in commercial? It keeps on going, keeps on going. When other batteries have died, this one keeps on going two or three times more than or longer than the others. Not only two or three times, but Imagine it goes on forever without recharging or replacing the battery. Is not God with infinite reserve of energy and, and love and all that we need to, to live our lives for God? Doesn't God give us that provision that is everlasting? He does. And all I have to do and all you have to do to each other is to simply remind one another of that. Because of our fallen flesh, we may not sometimes some um, do as, as why, what we should and how we should. We just need to be reminded, look, you, know, you have the energy and provision from God. You have love from God because you are saved and you want to serve God and you love one another. And just click on the switch every now and then and then the energy of God, the power of God moves you. And that's why. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, the love of Christ compels us. The word compel is to uh, kind of um, to give you energy. It is to uh, energize from within, from inside. The love of God, in some translations, says the love of God controls us. The love is the power. The love is the motive. And that is what controls and compels us in our Christian living. And that's what church is. Church is to be moving because of love. If you take love out, it's like taking the fuel out of a car. It's like taking the battery or out of a toy. You have no power. And when there is no love, the true love of God, then you might be doing things, but it is like winding a spring, only to lose that power very soon. And you have to put in more energy so that you can keep moving for some time. But it is so draining and so... I, mean, I don't want to be in a church where I have to go around and ask people and persuade people and convince people to serve and to do things in the church. I mean, do you? Wouldn't you want to be in a church where people are so eager to do and serve and to work for each other and for the church and all you need to do is just encourage one another? That's the picture we have in the Bible. You go to the early church and that's what they were doing. They were doing um, breaking bread and coming together to pray and to fellowship with one another and preaching the gospel and the church was added with people who were being saved on a daily basis, day by day. And we want to be with that kind of church. And I believe that we are. And I believe that you know, we all love God and love one another and we all want to serve and there's no one who's doing what we're doing in the church because someone just told you. Because you know, even though you don't want to, you just think that you have to. 
We are doing because of some legalistic compulsion. We are compelled by the love of God. And that's what Paul says here, love one another, because this love is the fulfillment of the law. Having said that, what I really want you to get to is, is from now. Verse 8, he says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. Let's focus on that first part of that verse. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. As I told you, this is not a teaching on some finance. Always the word or the language that, that Paul uses here is, is reminding us of some kind of financial debt. Owe or owing something uh, implies that there is something that you have to pay back, like a debt. It's a language for debt. And the use here is not so much for finance. It is for relationship. It is for love and love in, in relationship. If you look at the word owe, um, that has also um, some connection with debt or indebtedness. In other words, basically, when you owe something, then you have obligation to pay back. Debt means, or owe means, that you are obliged to repay. And that's some kind of obligation. If you look at the actual word meaning, the word owe, the meaning of the word um, can be uh, debt, obligation, and also um, ought to, you know, O-U-G-H-T, to, ought to. You ought to do this. It is to make something right. So when you owe something, you've got to pay back to make it right, because you actually borrowed it, or that person has lent to you something, and you, you just pay back, sometimes with interest, and interest itself is not bad if you charge exorbitant interest like usury, then the Bible prohibits against that. But you can pay back with interest, you can pay back the principal, you pay back what you owe. So when you say something like, I owe you something, it means that I need to give you something. That's the picture. You have some obligation, but here Paul says, owe no one anything. So don't owe anything to anyone except to love one another. In other words, this is how you can put it. You have no other obligation except the obligation to love. Does it make sense? You have no, you should not have any debt other than the debt of love which you have to go and, go and pay back. So except to love one another. Because if you love one another, then you fulfill the law. You have actually fulfilled the obligation to love. One another also indicates that this is mutual obligation to love. It is not to just one, it is not just one way to the particular person, but it is to do it together, one another. It is as if that you have a debt, but there is no other debt, but the debt is the debt of love. You must repay with love. You must repay because you have received. It implies that you have received or you borrowed, so you repay. Received what? Received from who? As we read in John chapter 13 verse 34, it says, love one another as I have loved you. As God has loved us, we love one another. We received love from God. We received love through Christ. And therefore, we are to love one another. So you can repay the Lord's love by loving one another. That's what it is saying. And that's the only thing that you are obliged to do. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 1. It's a very simple principle, really. God loved you, God loves us, and therefore we love one another. Um, in a sense, we receive God's love and the way in which we can pay back that love towards God is by loving one another. As, G, as John said in 1 John chapter 1, you say you love God, then you ought to show that and demonstrate that as you love others. But in chapter 3 verse 16, 1 John, chapter, six, chapter 3 verse 16, he says this, 
John says, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. How do we know that he loves us? He died for us on the cross. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Why? Because we love the brethren. God loved us so much. Jesus loved us so much that he gave up his life. God gave up his son's life. So you should go and love one another. And how do you show that? You ought to be able to lay down your life for one another, for your brethren. In a sense, what we received from God, we cannot repay God in full or in sort of any way. The only way we can repay God for what we receive from God is to love one another by repaying to one another. Now let's pause there a moment for a, bit, for a moment and think about this. Some people, well, in fact, some people say this. Salvation is free. Yes. So, are we supposed to repay? Doesn't that involve the thought of legalism? Are you saying that we have to do the things for God? Are you saying that, is that how we can be sort of um, acknowledged and praised by God? Uh, are we doing something just to please God and you have to do certain things almost in a sort of legalistic way? If you're saved free, I mean, shouldn't you just do if you want to do it? I mean, are we under any obligation to repay and to serve God? He says here, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. Oh, is the words that uh, indicates some sort of obligation. You are actually indebted to do certain things for God and to one another. Some people might say, well, if you're saved, isn't that enough? Uh, we're saved freely. I mean, there's no condition in God's love. By the way, you know, we can never repay in full. So, you know, wh what are you saying? Uh, if you're saved, then do you have to go and do something to repay, to make up? Is that like a transaction? God saves you and you do something for God? Of course, we know that whatever we do, we can never repay in full for God's grace. It's like that parable in Matthew, where a servant had 10,000 talents of debt, and it's all wiped away. Because he, he had no way of repaying that at all. We can never repay for our salvation. We know that. But also at the same time, there are verses like this. Let's go back to Psalm 116, 116 in Psalm, in the Old Testament. Psalm 116. In verse 12, it says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? In other words, what shall I, what shall I, no, how shall I repay to the Lord for all the benefits toward me? This is the question that the psalmist is asking. This is um, kind of a rhetorical question to himself. He's saying to, to himself, how can I repay the Lord for all the benefits toward me? What shall I render to the Lord? What shall I give to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? This is the logical, hard response of someone who has received so much from God. This is the heart of gratitude. This is the heart of thankfulness. And he answers himself, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. This is the heart of worship, heart of serving, heart of proclaiming the gospel of salvation. I mean, make no mistake. Salvation is free, yes? But it was costly, wasn't it? It cost Jesus' life to save us. It is given to us freely but God had to purchase us by paying the price with the son's death or with the son's life. It was costly. And we can never pay its price. We can never purchase salvation, of course not. We can never repay to make up even after you're saved, of course not. But we have this yearning desire like the psalmist to want to repay to our God for his love. We just want to do that.
what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits for me? Even if I have to give my life for him, I would. This is what the psalmist is saying. Even if I would give everything that I have, I would. And that's why, as I said before, everything that we do in church must be out of love. Love for God and love for one another. It should not be a drag or drudgery. We all want to serve God and we all want to repay God. We have the forever provision from God to enable us to do that. We might need reminding from time to time from the Word of God, and that's why we come together on Sundays and other days when we come, we look at the Word of God, we remind ourselves, we encourage one another, and we remind each other that we do have that energy and power and motivation to serve God and to serve His church. In other words, let's put it in this way. Going back to our text again. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. This is like saying we are indebted to one another to love. You have no other debt but this debt that you have to pay back, that you have to pay back by loving one another. You pay back to the Lord by loving one another. And that's how it goes. The love comes from God vertically, and then love flows through each other or one another horizontally. That's the community called the church. And the perfect illustration of that is in Matthew chapter 18. As I said before, in that parable of talent, this one particular servant has 10,000 talents of debt. Too much to pay. It's like billions of dollars he could not pay back in his lifetime. So the king wiped away that debt and said, don't worry, I'll, I'll forgive your debt. It's all gone. And he's so happy, he goes out, happy and rejoicing, and he sees another servant who owed him only 500 talents, some two to three thousand dollars of money, compared to billions of dollars, it is practically nothing. And the first servant says to the second servant who owed him 500 denarii, pay up. And when he couldn't pay, they put him into prison. The king heard about the story and he became very upset and very furious and he called the first servant and said, I wiped away and forgave your debt because you couldn't pay. And should you not have also compassion on your friend, on your servant, who owed you only 500 talent, 500 denarii? In other words, the king was demanding the same kind of mercy, or even a fraction of the mercy that he had shown to the first servant, uh, so that he would show that to the second servant. But should you not have done the same as I have done to you? That parable, in a sense, um, tells us and reminds us that we are to do the same and be merciful and to be loving to one another as God was loving and merciful to us. So if you are saved, of course, you need to be saved first before you can you know, practice this. If you are not saved, this wouldn't make sense and this wouldn't work for you. But if you are saved and understand God's love, then you can go and practice by loving one another, by showing love to one another. And that's what happens in the church. Church is a place where you can practice this love. Church is the community of people who love one another, truly with God's love. So again, back to our text. Owe no one anything except, except to love one another. In other words, you owe each other to love one another. You are indebted to one another to love. You are under obligation to love one another. And if you love one another, then you have fulfilled the law. Because love, in verse 10, does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. The law exists so that the law existed in Jewish history and also in our society um, so that we would not do harmful thing, things to each other. That's the spirit and purpose of the law. And if you love, then you have fulfilled that intention of the law. The church, in a sense, is a perfect place. 
It's a place where you can live perfectly. On the one hand, we might say the church in this world is not perfect yet because we have not been glorified yet. But although it is not yet here, we have the perfect body or the community here. The perfect living exists in the church as we love one another. It's like saying no family is perfect, but family is as close as you can come to the perfect community. Church is the place where you can come and experience this perfect living. Just as God is perfect, you shall be perfect. Just as God is love, you shall be loving and love one another. At the same time, let me just point out that this passage in chapter 13 is not only for people in the church. We have just seen before that you are to obey the authority, to subject yourself to the world, the authority, the authority even in this world. So this actually has um, some, some um, implication um, for people who are outside the church. In other words, as Christians, yes, we love one another, but also we love those who are outside the church as well. We love them because neighbor is anyone who's other than you. So neighbor could be someone inside the church. Also, it can be someone outside the church. And you love one another. You can love one another in the church. For people who are outside, it's a bit hard to love one another in a sense that there is one way love. You give love. You love by sharing the gospel. You love by bringing the person to Christ to understand the gospel of salvation. Once they come into the church through salvation, then you, you can love one another. You can give and take and you can share love with each other. So then the question for application would be something like this. How do we love one another? So how, how do I love one another? I don't think it's something that I can teach you really because if you understand God's love, if you are saved, then, then you should know. I mean, even as a human being, we would know what love is, sort of generally or loosely speaking. You know what love is. You don't have to teach someone to love. Love is something that is coming from your heart. It shouldn't be hard. It shouldn't be difficult to figure out. Of course, love itself is laborious. Love itself is doing things and working for some things, and, and it, is, it is a labor in a sense. If you love someone, you, you work for that. If you love your children, you have a lot of work that you do for your children. If you love your husband, you love your wife, you do things for each other. Love is laborious, but it is not hard to figure out what to do or how to love. You know how to love. It is natural. It is kind of built in the human nature to love. We have even unsaved people have a little bit of remnant of goodness of God's love, I think. Um, but if you understand God's love through salvation, then you know what love is. And we saw that in responsorial reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is so and so. I mean, it goes on and on in that list. Let me just go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and read just a few things there. Love, he says from verse 4, love is patient, it is kind, it, is, it does not envy. Love does not parade, or is, is not proud, it is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It is not thinking of evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in truth. Bears all things, and believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things. And love never fails. Love never fails. You need love as a motivation, a motive, a power to live as a Christian that, that loves one another. And that's why in John chapter 15, Jesus said, there is no greater love than this, and that is referring to the love of Christ, enduring, perfect, patient love. And he says this after that, there is no greater love than this when someone lays down his life for friends. And he has done that. The greatest love is when you sacrifice yourself for another. It is essential to put others first. And that's why Jesus said, when he prayed in Gethsemane, not my will but yours, God's will be done for the sake of our salvation. 
Now, perhaps I can give you a little you know, suggestion. I don't want to reduce this magnanimous love to some trivial things that we do on daily basis, but in a sense, love is pervasive. Love extends from small little things to greater and big things. But when we actually bring it down to a practical level, we can maybe talk about a few things that we can do for each other as we love one another. Now, can I give you one suggestion? Now, in our bulletin, you might notice in one of the announcement items that we have what we call weekly catch-up. You see that? Weekly catch-up? Just get in touch with someone in the church during this week just to fellowship and to encourage one another and so on. So you can do this. Pray for one person in the church. You can do it with your family member, but if you do it with your family member, do something, do, do, do it with someone other than your family. So you might want to do it for your family, that's okay. Um, you do that all the time anyway. But, but in addition to that, pray for another person in the church. And either call or message that person this week and let that person know that you are praying for that person. You might want to ask what you can pray for if you want to be more specific. But just let that person know that you are praying to show that you care and you love that person. And also choose another person that is outside the church. Someone who's not saved or someone who you think not sure about salvation, and pray for that person. And also let that person know that you pray for that person. Of course, for salvation, but you might not say that uh, that very explicitly. But nonetheless, you say that I pray for you. You call, you message them, you message that, that person and say that. This is a small step of practicing love. Maybe you're already doing that uh, in, in some ways. That's okay. You can do it again this coming week or maybe do something else, something more if you like. But think about ways in which you can practice love. So from, from something very practical, very small, something that may seem insignificant, but nonetheless an act <coughs> of love that you can do with someone inside the church and someone who's outside the church. So two people pray for them, and tell them that you pray for them to show that you actually love that person. And owe no one anything. Do not owe anything, anyone, to anyone, except to love one another. And let's all pray. Father, we thank you for the timely reminder. And we are so grateful that we love one another and you have given us this amazing flock of people who are so full of love that we love you and we love one another as you commanded us. But we pray that this love will grow even deeper and wider so that we might know the height and depth and width and length of your love. We might grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the incarnation of love. May we be so full of love that it will exude out of our presence and that it will attract more people to us, so that they can come and hear and experience the love of Christ, so that they might be saved. All to your glory and to your honor and that your body on earth, the church would grow as you will. And we want to see that, Lord, happening in us with your blessing. Pray in Jesus' name.